Number 3. Thor Christensen Thor Christensen was born in Denmark in December 1957. When he was five, his family moved to California and settled in Solvang. Christensen was an intelligent young man, but in junior high he became more interested in drugs and alcohol than in school. He eventually dropped out of high school. During his teen years, Christensen developed some truly dark fantasies. On November 20th, 1976, at the age of 18, Christensen acted on those fantasies for the first time. He picked up 21-year-old Jacqueline Rook, who was hitchhiking near the University of California in Isla Vista. Sixteen days later, he picked up another hitchhiker. Like Rook, 19-year-old Marianne Saris was hitchhiking near the University of California. He took a break for a month, and then he picked up 21-year-old Patricia Laney, who was hitchhiking in Isla Vista. Christensen shot each of them in the head with a 22 caliber pistol, and then he had sex with their dead bodies. Laney's body was found the day after she went missing, dumb next to a remote back road. The day after that, Rook's body was found a short distance away. Nearly five months later, Saris' body was found. About a month after the third body was found, the police talked to Christensen. They weren't talking to him about the murders, instead it was because he got caught with alcohol in his car and he was a minor. The police officer asked to look in his trunk and at first Christensen refused. So the police officer took Christensen's keys and opened the trunk himself. In a paper bag he found a 22 caliber pistol which was the murder weapon. The officer confiscated the gun but let Christensen go. After the three murders and his brush with the law, Christensen moved to Oregon. He didn't stay away for long though. Two years later, he moved back to California and started picking up women again. On April 18, 1979, he picked up 22-year-old Linda Preston, who was hitchhiking in Hollywood. After driving for some time, Christensen pulled out a 22 caliber handgun and shot Preston in the head. Amazingly, the shot didn't kill her. Preston managed to get out of the car and she ran for help. She ultimately survived the shooting. On May 26, 1979, Laura Sue Benjamin, a sex worker, was picked up by Christensen. He shot her once in the head and then had sex with her body. Her body was found a month later, dumped near a highway in the mountains north of Los Angeles. Two months later, on July 11, 1979, Christensen walked into a bar in Hollywood. In the bar was Linda Preston, the woman he shot who had survived. Preston recognized Christensen and she called the police. He was arrested that night and when the police looked at his records, they realized that they still had his 22 caliber pistol. It was tested against the bullets used to kill the three women in Isla Vista, and it was a match. Christensen pleaded guilty to the three Isla Vista murders, and he was sentenced to life in prison in June 1980. He was sent to Folsom Prison to serve his term. Supposedly, a psychiatrist that worked on the case warned that Christensen shouldn't be put in general population because he was young, blonde, and because of the crimes he committed. The advice was ignored and Christensen was placed in general population. On March 30, 1981, Christensen was outside in the yard. Someone walked up behind him and stabbed him once in the heart with a shiv. Christensen died nearly immediately. He was 23 years old and he wasn't even a year into his sentence. Who stabbed him is a mystery that doesn't seem like it will be solved anytime soon. Number 2. Aku Yadu Aku Yadu was born in 1972 and he lived in the slums of Kasturbad Nagar, India. Yadu was a horrifying combination of a gangster, a rapist, and a serial killer. Yadu, along with his gang, ruled the slums by raping and sexually humiliating people. 
Some of his more horrific acts include raping a woman after her wedding. Another time, he made a man strip, then he burned him with cigarettes and forced him to dance naked in front of his daughter. One victim, who was raped 10 days after she gave birth, doused herself with kerosene and set herself on fire. Yadu liked to use rape and sexual humiliation to control the slums because he knew his victims wouldn't go to the police out of fear of shame. Even if the victims did go to the police, the police didn't do anything about it because Yadu paid them bribes. He could also get away with murder, it just cost more in terms of bribes. One of his known murders was butchering a woman on the street in front of her daughter and some neighbors. One of the horrified neighbors went to the police and he was dismembered as well. He also killed three other people and he left their remains on a railroad track. Over the course of 15 years, families kept their daughters locked up in their homes out of fear that they might be raped and murdered by Yadu and his men. The reason he got away with it for so long was because the police rarely got involved in criminal matters in the slum. He only got involved if it meant collecting a bribe. Since Yadu was the one paying the bribes, he was free to rape, torture, and murder whomever he liked. How Yadu made his money was by extorting people by threatening to rape them or someone in their family. One family that Yadu and his gang stayed away from was the Narnia family. They had five children and all of them went to college. In an area with high literacy rates, it was a feat that seemed impossible, so the family was highly respected in the slums. In the summer of 2004, one of the Narnia children, 26-year-old Usha, was on vacation and she was staying in her family shack. Usha worked at a call center, but there were big expectations that she would go on to hotel management, which is what she studied in college. One day while Usha was visiting, Yadu went to the Narnia's next door neighbor's home and threatened to kill the entire family unless they paid him some money. Afterwards, Usha told her neighbors to go to the police and when they didn't, she did. The next day, Yadu and 40 gang members surrounded Yusha's shack. She barricaded the door while Yadu stood outside with a ball of acid in his hand. He shouted through the door that he was going to rape, disfigure, and kill her. Usha shouted insults back at him, and she called the police. When the police didn't come, Usha decided that if she was going to die that day, she wasn't going to be the only one. She turned on the gas used for cooking and grabbed a match. She told Yadu that if anyone came inside, she was going to blow everyone up. Yadu and his men decided not to call her bluff, and they backed off. This act of defiance inspired other people in the slum, and they attacked Yadu's house. They smashed his windows and set his house on fire. The police decided to arrest Yadu for his own protection. A bail hearing for Yadu was set for August 13, 2004. Word spread around the slum that there was a good chance that Yadu would be released after the bail hearing. So a group of 200 people, mostly women, armed with rocks, vegetable knives, and chili powder, made their way to the courthouse. When Yadu was brought into the courtroom, he spotted one of his victims. He called her a prostitute, and then he threatened to rape her again. The woman took off her slipper and started hitting Yadu with it. She said something to the effect of, We can't both live on this earth together. It's you or me. Soon, the swarm of 200 people were on him. They hurled rocks at him, threw chili pepper in his face, and stabbed him. Fifteen minutes later, 32-year-old Aku Yadu was dead in the middle of the courtroom. He had been stabbed 73 times. One of his victims castrated him. Arrests were immediate, and Usha, who wasn't even at the courthouse, was arrested two weeks later. However, the case wouldn't go to trial for over a decade. Then in 2014, all 21 people who were charged in connection with the lynching, including Usha and five other women, were all acquitted due to lack of evidence. 
Many people thought that Yusha would be raped and murdered in retaliation, but she is still alive today. Sadly, she stopped working at the call center, and she never went on to work in hotel management. As of 2014, she was still living in the slum. Number 1. Dean Coral Dean Coral was born on Christmas Eve 1939 in Fort Wayne, Indiana. When he was 16, he moved with his mother to the Heights, which is a neighborhood in Houston, Texas. His mother opened a candy factory, and Coral worked on the assembly line. He would hand out candy to neighborhood children, and he often invited boys to play pool in the back room of the factory. In the late 1960s, Coral's mother closed the factory on the advice of a psychic, and she moved to Colorado. Coral didn't move with her, though. Instead, he got a job as an electrician, and he rented an apartment near the Heights. In 1970, Coral was 31 years old, and everyone thought that he was a nice and polite man. No one had anything bad to say about him, and he didn't have a criminal record. Living on his own, Coral started to explore his homosexuality, often with teenage boys. One of them was 15-year-old David Brooks. Brooks lived in the Heights, and his own father wasn't around much. Coral let Brooks crash at his apartment whenever he wanted to. Besides having sex with young men, Coral started to indulge in his dark fantasies. In September 1970, it's believed that he picked up 18-year-old Jeffrey Conan while he was hitchhiking, and he somehow got him back to his apartment. In the apartment, Coral tortured and then killed Conan. He then buried him. Months later, in December, Brooks walked into Coral's apartment unannounced. He was surprised to see Coral naked with two boys tied naked to his bed. Shocked to see Brooks there, Coral yelled at him to get out of the apartment, so Brooks left. At first, Coral told Brooks that the boys were part of a porn ring and he had been paid to send them to California. Coral later changed his story and told Brooks that he had killed the boys. The boys were most likely Danny Yates and James Glass, who were both 14 years old. They were somehow lured or kidnapped from an anti-drug rally in the Heights. Shortly after the murders, Coral moved into another apartment. On January 30th, 1971, Coral was cruising for another victim. This time, Brooks was in the van with him. They came across a pair of brothers, 15-year-old Donald Waldrop and 13-year-old Jerry Waldrop. They got the boys back to the apartment, and Coral strangled them while Brooks watched. Brooks then dropped out of school and hung out with Coral more often. For his 16th birthday, Coral gave Brooks a Corvette. On March 9th, Coral and Brooks happened upon 15-year-old Randall Harvey, who was riding his bike to work. Brooks knew Randall, so it's believed that he was the one who convinced him to come to Coral's apartment. Coral ended up shooting Randall in the head after torturing him. Then he and Brooks took his body to a storage unit that he had rented and buried him. The next to die was a 13-year-old boy and a 16-year-old boy that Coral knew from his days at the candy factory. In the winter of 1971, Brooks introduced Coral to his friend, 15-year-old Elmer Wayne Henley. Coral and Henley hit it off and became friends. Eventually, Coral told Henley that he was part of an organization that sold boys into a pornographic ring. Coral told Henley that if he brought him a boy for the ring, he'd pay him $200. One afternoon, Coral and Henley were out cruising, and they pulled up beside 17-year-old Willard Branch. He got in the van and went back to Coral's apartment. After Henley left, Coral killed the young man. He later paid Henley the $200 that he promised. Shortly afterwards, Henley found out that Willard wasn't sold into a porn ring, Instead, Coral had killed the young man. Like Brooks, he didn't go to the police. Instead, he helped Coral kidnap more teenage boys and young men. The next victim was Frank Aguirre, who was a close friend of Henley's. The trio worked together to tie him up, and then Coral and Henley strangled him. 
Over the next two years, Coral, Brooks, and Henley continued to kidnap and kill young boys and young men. This included killing a 16-year-old boy and then killing his younger brother 14 months later. All the murders were fairly similar. Brooks and Henley would strip the victims and then tie them to a plywood board. Coral would then rape, torture, and either shoot the young men or strangle them. Sometimes he would keep them alive for days. Henley would also help in the murders at times. The trio would then bury the bodies. Sometimes they would get their victims to call their family or send them letters to tell them that they are safe. Most of the victims lived in the Heights, which was a poor neighborhood. The police were used to runaways from that area, and they just assumed that was what was happening with all the missing boys, so no one looked for them. By 1973, the gang was starting to splinter. Brooks married his pregnant girlfriend, and he stopped spending time at Coral's apartment. Henley said he felt like he had to go to Coral's apartment to make sure that Coral didn't go after one of his younger brothers. On August 8, 1973, Henley and two friends, Tim Curley and his girlfriend, Rhonda Williams, went over to Coral's apartment. They decided to sniff some finishing varnish, and then they passed out. Coral came home, and he became angry that Henley would bring a female over to his place. So he tied each of them up, and then he dragged Henley into the kitchen where he berated him for bringing Williams to the apartment. Henley promised to kill her, so Coral untied him. Coral grabbed a 22 caliber pistol, and he handed Henley an 18-inch knife, and then they went back into the living room. Coral grabbed Curly and dragged him into the bedroom. The bedroom floor was covered with a plastic sheet, and there was a plywood board with shackles on it attached to the back wall. After attaching Curly to the plywood board, Coral came back into the living room and dragged Williams into the bedroom. Henley followed behind, and once in the bedroom, Henley grabbed Coral's gun. He aimed it at Coral and said, I can't go on any longer. I can't have you kill all my friends. He then fired six bullets into Coral. Dean Coral died at the scene. He was 33 years old. Henley and Brooks were both arrested, and they admitted to the murders. The police managed to find 27 bodies of boys and young men, and another body was linked to Coral through DNA, making Coral's official victim count 28. At the time, Coral, who was dubbed the Candyman, was the worst serial killer in American history. Not all of Coral's victims have been identified, and it's also possible that he may be responsible for even more murders. There were 40 young men who went missing in the same area around the time that Coral was active. Another possible victim is the young man seen in this photo. The picture was found among Henley's belongings, and the young man has never been identified. He doesn't match any of the known victims, and he could be a victim whose body was never found. Both Henley and Brooks were convicted for their roles in the murders, and they were both sentenced to life in prison. Thanks a lot for watching the video. Hopefully you found it interesting. If you did, please subscribe. We post a new video every Thursday and Sunday. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. The links are in the description below the video. But that's all for now. Thanks again for watching.